Welcome, everybody. Nice to see so many familiar, excellent faces. Um, this is our second uh, Art and Politics lecture for the semester. Um, thank you, Dan. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm really pleased. I'm going to be short and sweet with my introduction. Um, just for those who are new to the lecture, um, this is uh, the Art and Politics lecture series meets once a month. Um, this year, Monday nights at 6.30, uh, to discuss art, politics, and the filaments that tie them together in light of the many crises that face humanity. Um, in this year's program, we'll be discussing uh, American elections. We've talked about stickers We've talked about, and culture. We've talked about, uh, or we will be talking about, um, actual artists who enter into actual politics and become elected officials. Um, we'll talk about all sorts of things. Um, but today we're talking about kind of the most important thing, perhaps, and the thing that we perhaps should be talking about all the time. Um, I actually, I, I hope I don't scoop Marcus in, in mentioning this, but, you know, Noam Chomsky has been doing, um, who's very old, uh, and so I, I understand why he's thinking about these things, um, as we all should, but Noam Chomsky's been doing a series of lectures, oftentimes he calls them Racing to the Precipice, where he says that um, you know there are really two things that we all should be thinking about quite a lot because they're questions of the survival of the species as such, um, or an sich, as uh, the Germans in the audience will uh, attest to. Um, and those two things are the question of climate change and the question of nuclear weapons. Um, nuclear weapons, you know, there was a sort of odd period where we were oddly content on that question for no good reason as far as I can tell. Now that is maybe on our minds a little more. Um, and the question of climate change, which is so easy to deny, to evade, to push off, um, but really it seems to me for a, a thinking that's worth anything, um, a thinking that uh, might bring us a little light in the darkness, um, the question of the transformation of nature and where we're headed as a species is of paramount importance. Um, I'll say the other thing Chomsky uh, likes to say in those talks is, you know, there, uh, there's a great debate between Ernst Meyer, the, the great biologist, and Carl Sagan, the great astronomer, over whether human intelligence should be considered an evolutionarily adaptive trait, i.e., are we better off as a species for having been intelligent? And, you know, basically, the jury's still out. <laughs> and the question of how uh, we react to, uh, respond to climate change and the threat of nuclear weapons um, will decide, I think, that question. Was intelligence a kind of uh, a nice little blip to be passed away by the sands of time? Um, or is there something more we as a human species are capable of? Um, so with that, um, I will hand over the microphone to Marcus Quent, um, who we're really honored, Dr. Marcus Quent, a visiting scholar from Berlin, who we're really honored to have with us. Uh, briefly on Marcus, Marcus is a philosopher and writer. Um, he's a research associate at the Department of Art History. Forgive me for reading, it's just, you know, when someone has many honors to his name, um, you want to make sure to get all of them in your head. Um, he's a research associate at the Department of Art History, Art Theory and Aesthetics at the Berlin University of Arts. Um, after studying philosophy and theater studies at the Leipzig University, um, the Aberystwyth University in Wales, and the Berlin University of the Arts, in 2020 he completed a PhD on artistic constructions of time in Theodore Adorno, Gilles Deleuze, and Alain Badiou, um, all contemporary philosophers of note. Suppose we can call Adorno a contemporary philosopher still. Um, <laughs> Uh, in 2018, he was a visiting scholar at the New School for Social Research. His main interests are critical theory and philosophical aesthetics, theories of the contemporary and the philosophy of time, and he'll be presenting on several months of research that he's been doing on the question of the changing nature of time in art in light of uh, the current age, what we, uh, he'll explain what we might call the Anthropocene. So let's give him um, a really warm welcome. welcome. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy, for this kind of introduction and for the honor and the uh, possibility to speak here. Uh, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure. And thank you, Tom and yeah, Jeremy, to make this happen and um, um, yeah, for inviting me to this uh, lecture series. Um, two, just two brief uh, preliminary remarks. Um, the first thing is 
I mean, it's more uh, um, uh, a work in progress. So I'm laying out some materials, but it's and some problems, and for a lot of them, I also don't have a solution yet. So I'm. It's more like, yeah, uh, uh, an invitation to to discuss those things together, which I hope we can do after uh, after the presentation. The second remark is. English is not my first language, so there might be some passages where my pronunciation gets a little bit weird. If it's too too heavy, just give me a sign and I try to rephrase. Uh, and the third one, uh, the third remark is, um, in the second half of the talk, I'm, I'm going to have some artistic uh, practices, some artworks included. Um, three major tendencies I, I want to present, um, and just as a remark there, the selection is in a way contingent and subjective, so it's not at all that I want to say this is the exhaustive uh, presentation of what's out there, and it's also not meant as a kind of a canon or something, it's just like what I encountered in, in the last couple of months, and it's, it's of course related to my, uh, um, my experience and my um, 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 time, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's my, that were my three remarks before I begin, and now I'm going to start, and um, yeah, it's a written paper, I try to be it as much as flexible as I can in my, as English is not my, <laughs> my first language, uh, and I'm going to speak about roughly, let's say, 40 minutes, uh, and then um, we're going to have a discussion. So, before February this year, when uh, Russia launched its war on Ukraine, talking about the nuclear threat seemed rather old-fashioned. Those who were addressing a potential self-annihilation of humanity, a coming mass extinction of human and non-human life on this planet, were above all relating it to the urgencies of climate change and the multiple layers of an unfolding environmental crisis. During the last couple of months, though, the horror scenario that haunted people's mind during the Cold War came to life again. And with it, the eerie language of deterrence spoken by state officials on all sides. Suddenly, we find ourselves being set in the prospect of Armageddon, left with the uncertainty if this is a mere description or an announcement. To be clear from the start, the recurring nuclear threat is by no means rendering environmental issues and the ongoing ecocide less important, as Jeremy already pointed out. It is rather showing vividly that we are confronted with two apocalyptic scenarios at the same time. Environmental crisis and nuclear threat are the two negative event horizons of contemporary life, implying different temporalities, but overlapping in our present. There is a side of the overlapping of both threats, as the Croatian philosopher Sreczko Horvat has re recently highlighted in his book After the Apocalypse, namely the Marshall Islands, where the United States conducted more than 60 nuclear tests between the years 1948 and uh, 1946 and 1958. And I quote him, as a low-lying atoll island nation, little more than one meter above sea level, the Marshall Islands represent the literal ground zero of the collision of eschatological threats that are no longer just lying dormant in a far-off science fiction future, but actually exist in a dystopian present. End of quote. Today we might be afraid of the prospect of Armageddon, Though this nuclear threat conceals the history of nuclear testing with all its victims all over the world, conducted a lot of times by not only the United States, also Russian Federation, China, United Kingdom and France most intensively during the 40s, 50s and 60s, and still up to date by North Korea. Sometimes we need to change our perspective and realize that the apocalypse is not something that lies in the future, but something that has already happened, unfolding in the present. The cover of Horvath's book shows a picture of a site that emblematically represents the overlapping, and the, uh, overlapping of environmental crisis and nuclear threat. It is a picture of Runet Island Dome, 
in the Inner We Talk Atoll that the locals just call the Tung. From 1977 to 1980, waste and topsoil debris from different testing sites have been collected in this nuclear blast crater by the US military, mixed with concrete and then entombed. Rising sea level today increased the danger of its erosion. And there is another quote by Sreczko Horvat. Never have the past and the future, the bomb and the tomb, been juxtaposed in such frightening way. That what has been, what created the crater, is literally waiting to happen again. It actually never went away. It was just buried in a protective tomb whose architects didn't take into account the rising sea levels. And just like Freud's return of the repressed, that which is buried is always waiting to return in a much more sinister way." End of quote. So the image of the end is present again, and maybe actualized from a, a present before already, an end of the world, an end of time, an end of history. Before raising consciousness about the devastating and threatening effects of climate change, mostly done so in the last two decades, the discourse of the 80s and 90s have confronted us also with two types of the end of history. Maybe you remember there was the famous Francis Fukuyama's affirmative end of history, kind of nurturing the optimistic belief that the sense of history would realize or fulfill itself in the global proliferation of liberal democracy. And there was the postmodern end of history, like a grand, like a farewell to grand narratives, which is a way of another hand, end of history, that was alternatively welcomed by some as a dis disengagement from false totalization, or criticized for denoting a lack of historical sensibility. Both of these ends, so the liberal end of history and the postmodern end of history, both ends were in a way affirmative, meta-reflective meta ends of history. The claim of the liberal end of history is, so to speak, a post-apocalyptic one, insofar truth has been revealed in it already. And the postmodern end of history is a post-apocalyptic one too, but insofar as it shows that truth uh, is something relative, something conditioned, um, uh, in extreme case, just seen as an effect. Today, the image of the end of history is present again, in the double negative form. One could add, it is not only present, but it is also maybe omnipresent, or to put it stronger, almost inflationary used. So, we must take also in consideration that the image and the imagination, the logic and the rhetoric of the end entails a curtain, a certain problems. Addressing the end is a gesture of closure. It always implies an act of totalizing a situation, subsuming different phenomena or unifying multiple experiences and processes. So where ends are in question, it is always about a temporal horizon and a temporal projection. It is always about anticipation as well as delays of the end. So you could say in the announcement of the end, at the same time the end seems to transform itself over time. The figure of the end therefore should direct our attention to questions about the construction of time itself about what and how time is established in it. Bearing this in mind, however, we could ask ourselves what kind of intelligibility of time itself the apocalyptic entails. Given the widespread feeling of living in end times, the omnipresent doomsday scenarios in Western societies, we could ask what is the context and the status of the figure of the end in the sphere of the contemporary? 
what does it reveal about experiences of temporality and historic intelligibility? My first thesis here, and it's, it's not an original one, so I didn't kind of, I'm not the first one who comes up with it. My first thesis here is the temporality of the apocalyptic end is the negative, the flip side of the temporality of the modern. Or to put it differently, the subjectivity of the catastrophe, of the catastrophe, is the negative image of modern subjectivity. If we want to go one step further, we could claim they are one and the same. So the thesis is here, the apocalyptic is structurally inscribed in the modern. Utopian and dystopian subjectivities are not in mere opposition, they are intertwined in many different ways. When we, when we hear the word ap apocalypse, um, we could maybe say um, something maybe I forgot to introduce about this notion or word, which is important. When we think about the original sense of the term, it's not only an end, um, there is also the end, this, this addition is important, it's an end that is a disclosure or a revelation, yeah? when you think of also the, the religious aspect of this word. So the apocalypse is the end that is thought as the event of the truth or the manifestation of a final judgment. In a way, the revolutionary modern, and this is what I'm, I'm trying to sh kind of show why um, um, the, the utopian and the dystopian are connected in the modern, because in a way, the revolutionary modern with its orientation to a coming fulfillment was kind of apocalyptic in structure, as well as the modern revolutionary subject is quasi-eschatological. We are kind of so much used to the idea of the modern as a process of secularization, of the modern as a linear history of progress that is connected with the disenchantment of the world. But nevertheless, in all of this, it is still rooted in eschatological thinking. And before I'm going to start with some artistic examples, I'm going to um, dwell a little bit on this notion of the modern temporality. Yeah, to say a little bit of more, what's really this temporality of the modern? What is significant for it, right? At least in this dom dominant temporal mode uh, in the 19th and 20th century in Western uh, discourse. First of all, what's important about the subject of, of modernity, I think, is that it is essentially oriented toward the future. The future is the leading temporal mode of the modern, equipped with the capacity to fill the promises of the present and the past. For the modern subject, past and present actions are essentially means to a fulfillment that lies in the future. In the modern paradigm, the present is understood as the raw material for the future, or of the future, as the medium of its arrival. Thus, for its own sense-making, the present is dependent on the future, and at the same time, for the, sake of his, for the sake of this future, the present is something that must be transcended. So where the future is thought of as the time of a coming fulfillment, the present, or the here and now, is always both. On the one hand, something that allows this future to arrive, that enables to realize itself, but on the other hand, also something that delays this realization and that one must accelerate. So the present must be bypassed in as much as it hinders the fulfillment of our promises, the realization of the future ends. For the modern, so to speak, there is an end lying in the future that it is always still to come. And since the future end is ever pending, one wants to overcome the present, to just reach the future end a little bit earlier. 
This temporal mode with the present being a mere passage of the future has its own underlying promise. Namely, that the coming fulfillment will ultimately sublate the present. The present will be elevated to a bright future or by a bright future. So the prom promise is all the time, one day it will pay off that we constantly need to sacrifice our own being here and now for the sake of the future. Maybe this future-oriented subject of Western modernity when, is when we describe it more precisely, in fact, kind of this European revolutionary or, or utopian modern subject of the avant-garde of the 19th and 20th century. One could say maybe the American variation of this modern is oriented towards the future as well, but due to its different history in which the revolution has already happened, it projects the future as already realized in the present. And this is exactly what Francis Fukuyama wanted to universalize in the 90s when he spoke about the end of history after 1989. It was an act of projecting the coming of a future fulfillment here and now in globalized form. The liberal ideal is essentially incorporating the utopian future within the present. So, when this belief in the capacity of the future to fulfill promises made in the past and the present arose, or when the reference to future in general becomes fragile, modern temporality enters a crisis. Vice versa, the temporal mode and the concept of the present come noticeably into focus at exact the same moment when the conception of modernity with its emphasis on the future is questioned. One enters a paradigm where the modern project is critically reflected and reconsidered rewritten or even overwritten, the time of the postmodern. One could say the postmodern as well as the contemporary, if you see the latter as a third temporality, are investigations in the structure of the modern, emphasizing moments of delay, hindrance or repetition. And they do so not as deficient moments, but almost like unraveling the preciousness preciousness of that time, of the time of the doing and making. So doubt and hesitation, uncertainty and indecision broaden the interval of the present. And I think this is kind of an experience for the contemporary, right? That this interval gets broadened and extended. But nevertheless, still today we have in a way contemporary substitutes or flip sides of this modern temporal form of the future. I think we can easily identify them in the promises of global markets that structure our society, in the form of new age religions or in terrorist nihilism in a negative form. But they are also affected in the everyday life ideology of a good career when we strive to become a successful artist or an esteemed scholar and sacrifice everything for these aspirations. It seems that we as finite beings need kind of eschatological substitutes. So there are these distorted ideological fragments of the modern, but in general I would be tempted to say today we are rather beings without a project. We might work so-called project-based all the time in our neoliberal project culture, but without any clear orientation in time, lacking historical, lacking historical intelligibility as well as the capacity of constructing our time, besides those non-times of the market and the career. So today there is a kind of liberation of the present in its finite being, Without subordinating it to the past or the future, the present is released from its function to be a mere material for a glorified project or any given tradition. But as Boris Kreuz has pointed out nicely, at the same time, this exploration and extension of the present, present can be seen as a new form of being stuck. Being stuck in a present that just merely reproduces itself 
that is just mirroring itself. So where we experience the proliferation of the present, it is also at the same time very often criticized for erasing the past and the future. The danger is here as like figures as Boris uh, or like authors as Boris Koy said, without a project, time is simply lost. But others might say, for example, the French philosopher uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, that exactly this need for a form of sublation of time in any kind of project is part of the problem. So as you can see, the exploration of time in any kind of, uh, the exploration of an extended time of the present in its mere passing by can be seen or experienced as liberation, but also as a void or a feeling of being stuck. And the crisis of time or the disorientation of time in the temporality of the contemporary is exactly this, an intermediate time that is in a way liberated, ever renewed and prolonged, but in this form kind of remains ambiguous. I would be tempted to say that a lot of the psychopathologies of the contemporary are exactly related to the impasse of this construction of time. Um, so, with the environmental crisis and the nuclear threat, the ecocide and the atomic doom, the modern is circulating today within the space-time of the contemporary in the form of its negative, as apocalypse. It is circulating insofar as this negativity, negativity is accompanying, accompanying us for a long time, but also since the structure, as I try to argue, of the modern is itself implicit apocalyptic. Today, modernity as a linear understanding of progress and as a narrative of industrial, industrially driven ascent has been confronted not only with its colonial and exploitative structure, but also with its violence in ecological terms. The symptom of this modern, the autonomous, so to speak, self-producing subject has encountered its consequences and costs. One of its main consequences, and I would like to um, get to my first um, artistic material here, one of its main consequences and costs is what the English language knows many variations for. Garbage, trash, waste, litter, clutter, junk. And with waste, there are some interesting things happening in art. Amid an ongoing environmental crisis, Contemporary artists are quite often concerned about the enormous amount of trash in this world. Contemporary art, in a way, is absorbed by trash or immersed in trash, sometimes. The artist quite often appears as someone who explores and transforms discarded things, collected, collects washed up objects, and reuses or recycled dumped materials. If one, make, want to make a nasty, if one wants to make a nasty joke here, one could say contemporary art is trash art, the art of trash. Where the world goes to waste, art becomes trash art. Jokes aside, this is by no means meant in a derog derogatory way. There are a lot of artists who do not want to produce more and more waste while doing their work and with their work. Not only can we observe how artists deal with materials and resources in new ways or how the art world itself adjusts their modes of produ producing and distributing, rather there are more and more artistic practices that are in their form and content about saving and rescuing the residues and byproducts of life in globalized modernity. Nowadays, we see a lot of artists that are consciously reusing or recycling trash, waste, garbage, for their artistic work or even refuse to use new materials. The emblematic material here, of course, is plastic. A most peculiar example you can find in a current exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum that some of you might already have been visited. In Death to the Living, Long Live Trash, 
Duke Riley uses materials collected from beaches to address both local pollution and global marine devastation. His work is about the effects that the oil and food and beverage industry have on the environment through single-use plastics. His artworks are, as you can see, contemporary interpretations of historical mar maritime crafts, such as scrimshaw, scrimshaw, that is ink drawings etched into bones by sailors, sailors' valentines and fishing lures. He used, he kind of recycles or reuses plastic containers, detergent bottles, toothbrushes or other waste. So here you have a good example of an artistic gesture that with precision and patience and utmost admiration for craftsmanship tries to transform the literal residues of the modern into beautiful works of art. So this last image is kind of uh, um, the uh, a different example, but it's also in that exhibition. Um, another example I want to show is uh, Tita Salina, an artist from Jakarta, Indonesia, with her work 1001st Island, the most sustainable island in archipelago from 2015. Together with local fishermen that are affected by waste management and polluted water in this area, the artist collected marine debris and plastic trash in the area and then turned them into an artificial island. And you can find her work online. There is also a kind of a, this is just stills from a video. It's like a 15 minute long video where you can see how this island is made with the help of the local fishermen. Contemporary trash art tackles the overproduction of commodities as well as the, the abundance of artworks. It tries to escape the temporal mode of intensified production that renders invisible the invested labor as well as the leftover of its consumption. On the level of time, it encounters the enforced time of depletion and exhaustion. Time that does not, you could say the time of the market, that does not allow for any saving, preserving, or maintaining things. So I'm going to jump to uh, the notion of the Anthropocene in connection to the contemporary. Um, today, many disputes in ecology and the environmentalism are tied to the problems of scaling. Famously, there is the concept of the Anthropocene, of equal influence in the arts and natural sciences and controversially discussed in and outside academia. The Anthropocene, as you might already know, suggests a temporality projecting past and present human actions onto maximum timescales, thereby rendering indiscernible nature and history, the human and the geosphere. So with the emerging of this concept, the emergence of this concept at least two disjunct historicities clash together, natural history and human history. They collide, so to speak, in the flaws of the narrative of modernity. Facing the Anthropocene politically, philosophically or aesthetically, as Eva Horn puts it, and this is a quote, means to conceive of both the force of human agency and the human inability to control the effects and consequences of this agency." End of quote. Thus, the Anthropocene's agency seems sometimes dispersed and totalized at the same time. Thereby, different temporalities are intertwined and come into conflict, resulting in an indeterminacy as how to delimit our era. So you might have already seen that there are different concepts circulating. Is it the Anthropocene? Is it the Capitalocene, as others uh, might uh, name it? So what's really the, the main kind of force in, in this time? Um, the collision of disjunct historicities or intersecting historical temporality also affects the conceptualization of contemporary art. It does 
so not only on a mere chronological level of art history, but when using the concept of the contemporary as a critical term that is separated from the modern and the postmodern, it gets also kind of, um, um, it also affects um, our understanding of contemporary art. For example, think of the definition of contemporaneity Peter Osborne uh, has given in his book on the philosophy of contemporary art. And I'm going to show you this quite often cited definition. So he, he tries to establish a critical concept of contemporary art, right? That it's not just like a uh, chronological term or a stylist or a kind of a, um, a, a fashion notifier, but he tries to use it as a critical concept, yeah? And what, is, what does he say about the, um, this, the, the, the construction of this um, uh, concept? Uh, I'm going to read out the quote. What seems distinctive and important about the changing temporal quality of the historical present over the last few decades is best expressed through the distinctive conceptual grammar of contemporaneity, contemporaneity with a dash in between, a coming together not only not simply in time, but off times. We do not just live or exist together in time with our contemporaries, as, it, as if time itself is indifferent to this existing together, but rather the present is increasingly characterized by a coming together of different but equally present temporalities or times. And then there is this nasty phrase at the end, a temporal unity in disjunction or a disjunctive unity of present times. Quite a heavy expression, but this is kind of the result where he tries to combine this coming together that are in a way um, colliding or in coalition, but also for kind of um, allow a, a totalized form to emerge. So, and I'm trying to take this notion and also uh, um, um, uh, relate it to this notion of the Anthropocene. Um, so whereas the postmodern signal the rupture in historical totalization and unification centered around the modern notion of progress, the contemporary challenges historical intelligibility with its coming together overlapping of different temporalities, different times and spaces. If we understand contemporaneity with Peter Osborne as a coming together of different but equally present temporalities, the concept of the Anthropocene entails quite a challenge, I would say. Because the question then is, what does it mean with art or in art to not only think about the overlapping of Western modernity with other temporalities and sites of history as Osborne does, but to relate it also to time frames of the planetary and the terrestrial. What does it mean if we think the coming together of different times not only as a process of expansion and interaction of globalization, but also as an integrate, but also as integrating the supraliminal temporalities of the Anthropocene. So I think this is then the heavy task because in a way it puts a third kind of a third layer on this on this notion of temporality of contemporan contemporaneity. So it's not only anymore about the exhaustion of the modern and the, and the postmodern, uh, not only about a coming together of different space, spaces and times in the world on a global scene, but also about how to relate this to non-human temporalities, right? To non-human forces and actors of the planet, the climate and ecology. What is a contemporary situation then? Uh, in its definition when you want to relate it to these non-human forces and actors. So this is, this is I think, a problem one can one easily um, experience with this concept of the Anthropocene, that it's kind of overwhelming in its scale in a way, and also kind of 
yeah, in a way, it evades the human sensorium, right? So in addition to trash art, I would like to suggest a kind of second tendency or strand in the contemporary that is relating to what I just laid out as a problem. Um, this strand can take on quite different aesthetic form, but is in those different forms most concerned with the task of visualizing abstract processes, information and data collection, or finding central concretions for a transformative process that exceeds our imagination. For example, and this is a very famous but also problematic example, you could think about uh, um, Olafur Eliasson's work who installed giant glacial ice blocks in London and other cities where you could observe them, how they were slowly melting, right? This is a very <laughs> simple, concrete form of of a, a time scale proce process that is usually far away but also exceeding uh, our imagination. So this was 2014 and uh, the, uh, then also in other cities here is a picture outside Tate Modern. Um, um, and you could say when um, for this trash art strand that I uh, lined out the most emblematic Thing is plastic you could say for this strand it's a lot of time the ice you have a lot of also prominence of clouds as figures or spheres of um, ecocide or environmental crisis the artist here is concerned with visualizing an almost insensible time finding a visual representation or essential object not only to concrete devastating environmental effects but also for enormous timescales. Since the becoming geological of the human in the Anthropocene not only underground, ungrounds political commitments, but also undergoes aesthetic sensibilities, in turn art here becomes central to thinking with and feeling through the Anthropocene. So it's only, not just only an aesthetic experience, but it's also used as almost an um, yeah, maybe research kind of is, is too much said, but as a, as a concrete form of allowing us in the first place to relate to those problems, right? So many authors argue that the Anthropocene is above all a sensorial phenomena that is framed through modes of the visual. As a former documentary photographer, Justin Bryce, and this is another more more in the direction of visualization. I want to give you another example here. As a former documentary photographer, he explores the vis visualization of climate change. He was an embedded artist on a NASA mission on Greenland, and there he photographed some of the remote, remote places on Earth. His starting point is the scientific gaze. But he transforms the basic visual data into monumental works of art that combine aerial photography with complicated new printing techniques. And I hope you, I put a detail here, but it's probably hard to see. It's, it's about the surface of this work of art. And I think it's, yeah, the, the kind of image reproduction is not good to, to show that layer of this work, but I hope you can at least get a feeling with this detailed picture. During the printing process, he uses plastic, styrofoam and high permanence polymer ink, all materials that reflect anthropocenic time already on formal level. You see that in his prints, the shades of the landscape are reduced to monochromatic patterns. Almost all of the background information of the image is erased, turning it in almost into a work of abstract art. The melting ice becomes like a scattering of particles. But to this photographic view from afar in this gesture of abstraction and reduction, he adds a complex tactile surface, bringing the landscape uncannily close, which I cannot show you really through the, you know, through the image. With this artistic practice, which Eva Horn compares with the aesthetic of the sublime, while putting it also in sharp contrast to other aestheticizing documentary photographers, he accomplishes what she claims is a post-naturalist 
aesthetic of landscape. And I'm going to go to my last example before finishing in a couple of minutes. Um, besides trash art, the art of trash, besides visual representation or sensual concretization of time scales, there is a third artistic gesture I want to introduce at the end of my talk. It is not really a strand or an established form, rather a quite unique practice with an in and landscape that I encountered recently. And this third example is about touching uh, non-human time, the time of Aeon instead of Kronos, the chronological time. Located in southern France, the municipality Beauregard, with its little more than 200 inhabitants, is embedded in a particular nature region with unique limestone plateaus. Beauregard is literally translated as beautiful sight or beautiful view. At this site, over the last 25 years, the French sculptor Roger Rousseau, not the Rousseau you know from philosophy, another Rousseau, <laughs> has excavated the soil and uncovered rocks and stone slabs buried there for million of year, millions of years. In the beginning, it was a matter of exposing the rocks and using them as supports for his sculpture. This exposure, however, produced such a mineral, mineral expressiveness that the sculptor, struck by this overwhelming revelation, abandoned his original idea. He started to excavate and expose these huge limestone blocks that have not ceased to evolve with owing anything, without owing anything to human hands. So these are huge blocks of two or three meters high. And they are surrounded by a maze of passages and cavities. This artistic, and to, to repeat it, he did it over the last 25 years, right? So he just lives there and uncovered all these rocks like in a very <coughs> kind of continuous uh, 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 um, work. This artistic gesture is a highly idiosyncratic one, but at the same time modest and discreet. I reveal the existence of this reality. I do not change its content, the artist says. Rousseau's practice mixes archaeological and geological, architectural and maintenance elements. In an era where the geology bears traces of an ancient present of the ocean, he searches for clues, of, clues to the memory of the earth and its history intermingled with that of man. And yeah, it's also an era where kind of nature and culture have constantly interacted since prehistoric times. And he says, I, I know that I'm not looking for anything peculiar, only that this place exudes its own spirit. So it has a kind of a pathos also with this, but um, yeah, it's, it's a, a, a strange sight. I became familiar with this unique and strange artistic practice of Roger Rousseau thanks to an essay by Ulrike Haas, a German colleague who was professor for theater studies. And I just want to cite a, a passage from uh, an essay originally published in German in which she, in a beautiful, relates the experience of this site to questions of temporality. And then I'm slowly coming to an end. I'm going to give you the quote, it's a bit of a longer one. Regardless, and it's my translation, so there might be some mistakes, oh, of course. <laughs> so, um, regardless of whether or to what extent we are told in advance, the sight of these stones and rocks immediately silences any conversation. We look in the face of their silent presence and get lost in their silence. Their present, their mass, their presence, their mass, and their time is incomprehensible. The feeling of witnessing something extraordinary arises. This is our spaceship. When did we begin to despise the earth? Impossible is the thought of being able to own its soil. 
impossible to declare earth as property. The boulders were cleared of sand and soil that covered them. Not one of them was transported or moved. They have always been there. They are already there. Now they have become visible, forming sculptures of great beauty. They interrupt any conventional notion of time. The alien temporality grips us like a haze without the alien being transformed into something familiar. Rather that we become strangers to ourselves when we encounter the time of the stones, sensing that we always, always caught up in their time, that we are caught up in it at every moment. We share a life with these stones, these forms and masses. This life may take place in each case in completely different amplitudes, but it cannot be reduced to the alternative of active creaturely life and passive matter. It is not stony objects that have been excavated by Roger Rousseau, but a temporality of the immeasurable forces that formed them. It leaks out of the stone's materiality, its porous fissures and layers. Time pronounced with a definite, with a definite article in the singular and calculated by geochronology is suspended here. So here you have the artist as a digger, a digger of time. But obviously this practice of digging is not part of extracting something. It is not about carrying away resources for production, not exploiting the soil for producing commodities. It's that the artist as digger is an archaeologist of, of an eonic time, unveiling layers and strata of non-human temporality that interrupts the time of the chronos, the modern time of production. Today, the gloomy predictions about a potentially self-destructive future do not leave artistic practices unaffected. I would put it even stronger, as an artist in the contemporary situation, you must confront both images of our potential self-destructive future. Saying that I do not intend to advertise that suddenly each artist should address the topic of, of environmental crisis or the atomic doom in a vulgar way. Too often the art world as well as the academic world are driven by just appropriating buzzwords and celebrating fashionable issues. But in our daily practices, be they artistic, be they political, be they academic, we need to confront these temporalities of both event horizons. Neither is it possible to naively follow the dreams of a liberal end of history, believing the present is the realization of modernity, nor is it enough to invest all of our energy in the postmodern place with mere rewriting, rephrasing, endlessly deconstructing this modern liberal history. Looking at Roger Rousseau's practice, it feels as if in our times of undead globalized modernity and the circulation of its negative apocalyptic reverse, it feels it, as in our times with the liberal and the postmodern end of history being dismantled, dismantled, he establishes an aesthetic model for a general practice, a life form. What is this model asking us to do? Well, perhaps this. When the world goes to waste, do the modest work of digging. Thank you. It was a bit too long, sorry. It's all the time you write it down and think, oh, I don't have enough, and then it's <laughs> too much. So, yeah, I hope it got a bit clearer. I mean, there are, as I said, kind of sometimes odd examples. You might not think about temporality like in the first moment, but I wanted to lay out a couple of strands or tendencies. There are, of course, more. You could go more into more the experimentational side of how art tries to um, kind of experiment with new life forms in the Anthropocene, but I kind of limited to those three kind of paradigms or examples. 
and yeah i would be happy to hear what you think about it if you have thoughts on this double negative apocalyptic horizon how you see yourself in this picture what's your experience as artists or um, scholars or yeah or if there are any questions what you didn't understand or yeah i should i do the do you want to or yeah to? yeah just i was just wondering how you would uh, relate this to let's say periods of time of the 60s and 70s with earth art land art minimalism yeah i was very crucial and embedded in all that and i'm thinking there yeah 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 I'm, I'm I had the um, I, I kind of had the connection of course in my mind with this last example but also strangely in an eerie and unhappy way with this tomb picture this is also when you think about this first image that i showed it's kind of a, a strange resemblance um i'm not i'm not an expert in, our, in history of art of those of this period but i would say yeah there is is a certain uh, thing thing that this can help us nowadays that it comes back also i'm and a couple of weeks ago it was i was in die iron beacon and I felt like yeah this is so present in a way now again um, but yeah with this practice of uh, Roger, uh, Roger Rousseau I mean I it definitely has a, a, a resemblance but I don't know with him it's also this creating of this life form living in that place you know for 20 30 years almost like and also not claiming that this is even art, right? So I don't know if this how this would relate to the to that period you mentioned, but um, yeah, I, I have to think about it more. Yeah. Sorry that I cannot say something. This is the poetic aspect. Yeah. Yeah. I, Thank you, Marcus. I just, I, I so enjoyed your presentation because it made me appreciate all the more how difficult it is to actually to think conceptually about time. And then I was thinking about the Duke Riley examples and the single-use plastic that's disposed and he spends all of this time doing the scrimshaw on it. And I realized it's like my experience when I'm at the seashore and I look at a huge piece of granite and I have the thought, well, this, this big boulder will outlive me. And I'm kind of fine with that. But then when there's the plastic bottle next to it, and I also have the thought, this too will outlive me. <laughs> this, this seems like an affront, not just to my human existence, but an affront to my the character of my experience of time. So. Conceptually, time is very difficult to get it, but I think part of our inability to, to manage the temporalities that we're in the midst of is that we have all of these objects. That we also have to talk about photography at some point about this too, in this regard. But the single-use plastic is this very odd thing. We know exactly how long the duration of its use, the duration of its activity in the world, and then it has this afterlife that is out of all proportion. Um, so I, I really appreciated that, that, that sort of uh, the, the result of the experience of certain objects kind of in contrast to any of the temporalities that we experience. But I also wanted to recommend to everyone this wonderful book by Maria Stavronaki called Transfixed by the Prehistoric in which she argues that it was the invention of prehistory by geologists in the 18th and the 19th century, which really gave birth to modernity in the sense of, of the modern, because it was this realization 
by Europeans that um, that there was a time that there was a time before we knew ourselves that there was a time that we forgot within human experience and that she interprets the modern uh, modern art as an alar in, 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 to a large effect trying to sort of reground the beginning of human experience and human making because we're confronted with this temporality in which we know that we existed but we have no memory or no no continuity with it so we're we're alienated from our own existence yeah. strangely like our experience of the temporalities that Osborne and others right yeah so I yeah there. yeah yeah with the plastic it's I find this I mean there is so much more to say and it, I'm not from the art history side, I'm not I'm not trained in it, and it's not sufficient because there is uh, so many layers. Also in the show, it's like kind of uh, put put in relation also to to uh, all the works, right? As kind of quoting this, quoting their aesthetic, or um, 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 kind of also reworking in a way, or kind of questioning the canon a bit. Um, but what I like about it is really with this plastic object that is almost this, um, yeah, this um, work of turning it into something that, that, I mean, lasts the same time, but also gives it a certain kind of aura in a way, right? Or a certain um, um, strength in a way. I don't know if any of you, anybody of any of you saw the show already? I mean, I, I know that some of you were in the Brooklyn Museum for another show, but um, it's 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 an interesting interesting exhibition there. Thank you for your talk. It was full of ideas and uh, very generative. I, I, I wanted to ask you about what I sense is the place where you started and the place where you ended up. And I'm craving a little bit from my friend who whispered something into my ear to give <laughs> credit. But you, you started this off with a, a sense of crisis, right? Not only the end of history, but perhaps the end of humanity, the end of the world. And I, I was very much with you. Uh, and we kind of ended up, in a way, um, with a Frenchman <laughs> on what I imagine is a kind of quite beautiful plot of land. Um, uncovering beautiful forms and a kind of deep time, kind of burrowing time, uh, trying to find something that, in a certain sense, kind of willfully doesn't have truck with an idea of contemporaneity. Mm -hmm. And I just want to ask a little bit um, what it might look like to kind of stay with crisis and not to end up with something that feels a little bit like redemption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, for me, the I, I've thought a long time if I include this last example because it in a way seems so much n not contemporary, right? But what I like about it, and I, I don't have really a clear solution, but I, the contrast for this alertness and crisis talk what I like about this gesture or this model that he presents is in a way that how you construct also your own time as an either be it artistic or political with a certain form of continuity, right? And it seems to me that a lot of times the, um, the talk of the apocalypse or the crisis, I would say it is important, it's inevitable because it's structurally inscribed in modernity anyways, but it's a way kind of um, w what it does with us as we are kind of being alert by this talk is sometimes that it doesn't create any form of continuity, right? It is fragment fragmented and like has the spotlights of attention, but it's also kind of paralyzing in a way sometimes, right? And of course, I I, I would not advertise any way this is the thing to do. It would also be, be strange, but, I, but I, I like the contrast of how, 
I mean, as I said, he he does this for like more than two decades. This what you could see is a bit of a remote work and it seems not contemporary, not attentive what's happening around you, but it's in a way of a trying to find a connection maybe um, beyond this just everyday alertness or crisis talk. So in this, it's, it's not a big thesis, but I find, find this interesting, this, this gesture. In the excavation of the stones, isn't he removing soil in order to get the stones and to reveal them? Which is to say he's removing everything that's, that we would be able to grow food in and that would help us to live. So he's showing us, a, he's presenting an apocalyptic image that at the same time has the ring of Stonehenge about it. <laughs> yeah. So he plays to time. I thought the first piece and the last piece, because the Elias and um, ice pieces are very similar visually in the way that they're deployed across the field to the last pieces. But then the person, and, and I wondered what that is about having things that were deployed evenly across the field, because the person in the middle actually comments on modernism. Um, modernism is where you get that overall painting that is so uh, an attempt to be completely present, and yet it's being completely present in something that is a catastrophe about the future, and also implies temporally memory of the image because it's photography and anticipation of what you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the soil, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of missing those images. He has also uh, around this feel like. I think there is a little wall kind of built and so he re reuses all the material that he kind of the soil that he is taking out and there is a bit of this of course kind of that he creates also this landscapes in a in a in a not only that taking out the soil but also building like a scenery in a way right um yeah sorry i didn't the, 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 the just a comment. There was a wall, a stone wall that yeah. was in the background. Of that. Yeah. Yeah, so you here you can see it in the back a bit. Not all built by him, but some parts. So yeah, that was sorry, I sorry, I don't know your name, sorry. <laughs> um, so you talked about um, contemporary art being sort of immersed um in trash, trash art. Um, and I'm really interested in sort of the alchemic properties of that trash art. Of the what? Sorry. Alchemic properties, so like alchemy, so how we're using uh, trash to create new things, um, beautiful things, um, and how that kind of relates to the natural processes of our earth and how the earth itself um, has its own regenerative properties, um, such as trees turning uh, CO2 into oxygen. Um, and does that, is that, could it serve as sort of like a modality for consciousness change mm -hmm. um, for us in engaging in that art? Mm -hmm. So you would say it's it's almost this reusing is almost like an imitation or mimesis through what what happens in nature. Yeah, if I got you right, right? Mm -hmm. I I don't know. Uh, I I don't want to kind of judge or say, but I I just feel that such a strong tendency. I don't know if what you think, guys, in your with your own practice or what you see around at our art school. I see a lot of people kind of reusing just things or we have we had a student who just did a lot did a, a sculpture of with used tea bags and things like this. I see there is a kind of a a trend and not only um, yeah to in a in a kind of moral term but also to exploring those materials, right? And um, 
I don't know if you feel maybe I'm also over interpreting it and it's, it's not but have you also this experience that this is quite a lot uh, out there and a lot of people are I mean not only plastic but other th things like um, a lot of also this discord that the art material itself like color and all this um, production process is in itself also creating waste and is uh, using um, yeah, a lot of energy maybe you could say. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. started with this seeing the present as a almost a symbol or symbol term of of um, kind of pathologies of time that I can also relate personally so this like I started 2015-16 with this work like the endless present or the present as being stuck so this was the passage I had there was I mean the things what I also did before before this this work and what I also can relate as a political problem to, I think that um, kind of this flip side or double image that the present is released and liberated and we are just allowed to live here now and be in the moment and that it's also important in the moment. This is this <laughs> term for the, that. This is also important as an almost you could say emancipative thing, but it, it's in the same time also that what causes sometimes suffering or feels like uh, you cannot get out, it's like a cage, you're caught up in it, right? So this was, when you would ask what's my motivation, this is kind of where it started and this feeling of the present, I mean, of course, through what ha happens, uh, uh, um, in our lives is that this I try to connect it with this apocalypse term what is this temporality of the apocalypse and is it really something that is now new or is it already part of this problem of the present that I described before so this is the kind of project if, if it is a project <laughs> yeah Oh no, I, I thought you could give me one. <laughs> I mean, 
this is the whole thing that you give me advice as well as you know. No, but it's I really I really can relate to this because it's almost like this as what I said about the end as this totalizing thing or this closure or this that it's kind of one to make you alert, wants to mobilize you, but it also since the scale is so enormous that it can has to have this paralyzing effect, right? So it's unclear what is actually the agency of the Anthropocene. This is a huge discussion, right? It addresses in a way this humanity with a lot of quotes. It's a highly criticized concept also in already in the globalization discourse, but it's now almost like a as a how you say blind spot or blank spot reappears that we constantly try to address this what's the global scale agency of this and of course there is maybe not a not as not an existent one right um, so I can I don't I can't solve it no well <coughs> thank you for your talk it's, um very interesting. I'm an art historian and teacher at School of Visual Arts, so I am really devoted to these objects. But I also, for many, a number of years now, have been involved with the philosophy of environmental justice and environmental ecology, and um, just accidentally got involved in part of the reading group with all PhDs who teach environmental philosophy. And um, so I'm coming from two different angles, and I appreciate your apocalyptic discussion because that's basically what we all talk about. And we we'll don't put it in those terms, but it's investigating the literature, this vast literature now, mm -hmm. on these issues. Sustainability, non-sustainability, do you live on half the earth? That, that was that Leo Wilson, that human beings should only be on half of the earth, the, the, the planet at the other half. I mean, it's just that what some people say that, the, that it's abundant, some say no, it's scarcity. Um, so I've been doing this for a long, a, a while now. We meet them just like, I keep trying to bring art in. These people know nothing about art or this history of hope. They don't dare to because they're philosophers. But um, how these objects and how the artists, and I don't mean to, I'm not trying to downplay what these young artists are trying to do, but nobody notices it mm -hmm. in that other world. Mm -hmm. And nor, nor do they talk about the Anthropocene mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. it, it's just a given. It's just a given that it's a trouble. It's trouble. It's human beings uh, that have instigated it. So um, I'm just commenting that when I meet with this group, I just have to forget. Although I keep mentioning the art. Oh, you know, there's this artist here or something. Mm -hmm. And they just say, we, I actually took them all to the Metropolitan Museum because we read Jonathan Prairie's book, The Scorched Earth. And he mentions a painting. He mentions the Rosa Bonheur at the market, which has nothing to do really with this. That was what, I don't know why he brought it in. I was trying to show them other things that actually dealt with some of the issues, like industrialization of the, in the impressionists, and time, talking about time there, and things. Weren't interested. They just weren't interested. Mm -hmm. and that's, I think, another one of these issues. This is another one of these problems. That I think that these philosophers and these people we teach, they're all PhD philosophy um, people, should know more about how this filters in to the world yeah. and to the everyday world of things. Now, I think it's a big responsibility for the artist um, to try to show something I don't even know what it could be. I mean, I have, I'm it was said about it. I was hoping to come here to have an answer. I mean, what the, I can do. the connection is really, um, I think that it's in sense, it's about sensation and aesthetic sensibility. I think this is the key, right? That it's not just about observing an artwork, but the art itself in producing is, that was the passage when I said it's almost at, at and this scholarly and this artistic practice sometimes, I hope that mm -hmm. there are practices out there uh, like this, come together and work together. I mean, the recently passed away Bruno Latour was, I think, an example where he also had this collaborations with artists and was really about also delimiting these sections of knowledge and uh, academic disciplines, right? Whereas the artist was 
seen also as an contributing to maybe an epistemological problem in related to the Anthropocene matter. So I think, I hope at least there are other examples than the ones who... I think you know, Thomas, you just died last yeah. week. Yeah. Because I know that we all started talking about the Gaia, the Gaia um, uh, theory, but we've gone off with that. I mean, we read these bizarre things. That, I mean, I don't know how people spend their time on this. It's just... But anyway, um, he was, I think, one of the best to talk about it. The other name that comes up all the time on another thing, aesthetic level, is Aldo Leopold. Mm -hmm. And do you ever reference Aldo Leopold? Do you know who he is? He was an American naturalist yeah. who came up with an entire vision in his backyard of the universe. Okay. Watching it. Do you know about him? Yeah, and it's just beautiful to read. Mm -hmm. um, and about the destruction and natural destruction. We also have natural destruction, you know, the climate, the, the, the hurricanes and things like that. It's not just all man -made. Yeah. So it, people seem to refer back to Albert Leopold mm -hmm. um, a lot, which is kind of weird. I mean, it's, you can all join this group. We're looking for new people. <laughs> but it's, uh, um, I don't have to be the only artery person about Rosenberg. It's not as interesting as other artists about these issues. So. And I was wondering, what you, another question, with, with this new, tel the James Webb telescope, I get a picture every day about things that are 20 light years away, mm -hmm. 250 light years in the past. And it's mind-boggling. Yeah. About time. Yeah, and this would be the other, the, the, the other spatial. So this is this going inside the earth and the ground and soil, right? But also this extraterrestrial I think this is gesture, right? Yeah. Um, so there were two things I was thinking. One is more anecdotal, sort of like Tom's opening anecdote, but I was thinking about, you know, Susan Buck Morris, I know, a while back was working on projects about sort of time and catastrophe, and I remember her talking about, like, in early Christianity, how, uh, it, you know, basically early Christianity, everybody was counting down. Um, you know, it was like, oh, Christ will come, and 80 years, and you know, then you got to the 80 years, and there was a religious crisis because Christ had indeed not yet arrived, and so sort of counting up eventually was like a way out of a religious crisis thing. Yeah. Um, but I do, I wonder if there is an aspect in which we're returning to the sort of counting down. I mean, I think about, you know, even like the recent legislation in the Biden administration, it's like, such and such emissions will change such and such by 2030. Sort yeah, of thinking exactly. about, you know, yeah. kind of counting down towards things, or even, I mean, even how sort of New Year has started to feel, which is a little bit more like, you know, thank God that year's over, maybe <laughs> things are getting a little bit better. Yeah, like or, it, or, it, <laughs> um, or this Greta Thunberg, like, we have eight years, right? This, yeah. So it's, it's all interesting thing because the gesture it's always the same saying it's time is running out or there is no time anymore but in the same gesture mobilizing and saying now is the time right it's this this what interests me also it's it's with this reference to the end almost saying it's over forget it like clock is it's past right but in this moment one wanting to stir up or to mobilize for act now right and it's it's a bit paradoxical in a way because of course then you have all the people when you when you have this apocalyptic discourse that say ah oh, it's a mere rhetoric right it's it's instrumental it's like a language game right and this is you all the t time Im immediately in those problems right Bruno Latour was also interesting in saying he had a passage in in this in this lectures on uh, Gaia, uh, facing Gaia in this book, where he says we have to actively reappropriate the apocalyptic discourse, right? Um, this was an interesting passage there, um, where he really, I'm tr I try to integrate it a bit, where he says the Western sh subject is exactly the problem that he thinks all the time apocalypse was is behind and now you live in the the realized kingdom already right this is a bit the, it, what he wants to tackle in this passage in the book and so every time you want to mobilize with this 
uh, uh, apocalyptic event is coming there are a lot of people saying ah this is a mere you know rhetoric trick or you're a guru or something right so yeah it's interesting how this is almost a toxic figure in a way because you you cannot use it without being accused of you know just making propaganda or annoying people or you know sorry i interrupted you maybe no that, that, that i mean that was the first the other thing i was just thinking of was um uh wait did i lose it i might have lost it um ah i think i lost it sorry so <laughs> this is my strategy just talk so long that people forget the questions <laughs> oh right i was gonna say about the contemporary it does seem to me like your talk maybe points to a little bit of a sharper view on the contemporaneity as like a, a temporal form that, I mean, couldn't we say that like the, the evaluation, even the overvaluation of contemporaneity was to some degree a defensive reaction in like, you know, sort of psychoanalytic terms, a defensive reaction to um, both to loss, like historic loss, loss of many things, um, but also to a kind of inability to face up to, you know, what is to come. And so, I mean, I almost wonder if a talk like yours could be a little more polemical and say we actually need something else than contemporaneity. Um, like, contemporaneity is perhaps not an adequate temporal category yeah. for what we're going through right now. Yeah, this is a heavy discussion because you... It, it, depends on who you talk with and how this author or person is using this term, right? I think with people like Osborne or in, in German context, this Juliane Rebentisch, it's like a very complicated gesture of saying or saving a bit historical intelligibility in this particularized multiplied present and saying the contemporaneity is a critical term right it's it's and also working against this maybe that simple kind of criticism that say ah this contemporary art it's like loss of history it's no critical awareness anymore no historical awareness right and they tried i think a lot of it was with osborne or Rebentisch and others, um, like in this five, ten years ago, to say no, it's a continuation of um, um, uh, of modern art in a way, right? It's not, it's not the exit from it; it's continuing certain threads. But maybe, yeah, maybe it's I, I got you where uh, I understand you that you say this is not enough anymore of. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good place to leave it. <laughs> yeah, we're over time, right? Time is running out. <laughs>